So in Genesis 26, verses 17 to 22, it says this. Then Isaac departed from where he was, and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerea, and he began to dwell there. And Isaac dug again, listen to this, he dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines, listen to this, had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and Isaac called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley, and they found a well of water there. But the herdsmen of Gerea quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he named the well Esek, because they quarreled with him. They dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also, and he named it Sitna. And he moved on from there and dug another well, but they did not quarrel over it. And he named it Rehoboth, and listen to this, because he said, For the Lord has now made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. May the Lord bless to us the powerful reading of his word this morning. I want to go back to verse 18, because this is what I believe God is saying to our nation right now. I believe it's what he's saying to the church right now in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it's about this. It is time to dig again. It is time to dig again. Verse 18 says that Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. How many of you are sitting here today, but somewhere in your journey you had a spiritual father? You had someone who sowed into your life, a church that sowed into your life, a ministry that sowed into your life, and you are here today moving a long way from that time, but there is still a residue, there's still a remnant, there's still something that's in your life because of what your father, your spiritual father, posted and did into your life way back then. And we are all recipients of a former move of God. There are things that happened. Penny was talking about storm camp. Uh, You know, in my life, I remember the powerful touch of God that happened to me in a camp. Or that happened to me in a conference or in a crusade or in some convention I attended as a child where there was a powerful move of God and God did something in my life and there was a deposit. You may move on in life and things may happen in our life, but how many people know God has planted a seed? He's planted a seed. It said here in verse 18 that Abraham and his servants had dug these wells when Isaac was just a child. When he was a youth. I'm so glad to see the energy and the, and the effort going into raising up youth in this time. And the sowing in and the raising finance to help youth be impacted today. Because how many people know a seed's going to get sown? That's going to leave a deposit. That's going to cause a move of God to happen. And we are all recipients and beneficiaries of what God is about to do. Isaac is a youth when his father digs this well. And they lived in that land a long time. And all the time that Abraham was in that land, water flowed from that well. But it says an interesting thing happened that after the death of Abraham... The Philistines, who were the rulers of the land, or the government of the land, began to fill the well in. And so here, years later, Isaac's been in another land, but because of famine, he comes and he follows the journey that his father had followed years before. He's heading down to Egypt, but he passes through the same land his father passed through when he was going down to Egypt a generation before. And he comes upon the well of his father. And I don't know about you, but surely in your life there will be a time where you recognize, man, I've been here before. You ever had one of those moments? We'd call it deja vu. But it's in the spirit, you have a spiritual deja vu moment where you come to a place or a meeting or an environment and you say, I've been here before. The message that's preached tonight I heard when I was 18 years old. And it impacted me back then. I was 21 or 24 or 26. It doesn't matter what the age is, but it was a season before. And this is what I come to say to you today. You may come around to a time where you've been before, but it's what you do with it when you know you're in that time. You see, what Isaac did, he looked upon a well that his father had dug before. He probably stood on the side of that well and going, wow. I remember these days, they were great days. I remember the songs we sang around this well. 
I remember the services we had around the well. I remember what God did around this well. And I'm looking at it today and I go, it's a shadow of what it was. I tell you what, I travel in lots of churches around this land and I see shadows of what they were. It's not pleasing to me to see a shadow of what was. When I know in this nation there's a history of a mighty move, charismatic move, Holy Ghost move, Pentecostal move of God that touched and raised up fire in our nation, souls saved, healing, deliverance, powerful moves of God. This church was part of it. My church was part of it. And you come back around and you go, are we a shadow? Are we a shadow? Are we a legend of the past? Are we just a monument now? Tough words, aren't they? I'm not sure Pastor Bruce will have me back. He comes back. The well might look the same, but when he looks into it, it's not flowing. It's filled with rubble. It's filled with dirt. There were three wells that were mentioned in the story. The well of Esek the well of Sitna, and the well of Rehoboth. Let me tell you what those mean. The well Esek means contention, fighting, squabbling, quarreling, contending for something. The word Sitna means opposition, battle. But the word Rehoboth means the Lord has made room and we will be fruitful in the land. Too many of us are parked at the wells of Esek and Sitna where we're contending and we're squabbling and we're fighting and with opposition but not knowing that we've got to move on from there because Isaac didn't park at the wells of Esek. He didn't park at the, at the wells of Sitna. He moved on to find the well of Rehoboth which is there the Lord will make room for us and we will be fruitful in the land. He came back to a place he'd been to before and he realized it wasn't just enough to mourn over what was. It wasn't just enough to say, oh, that's sad. That's devastating. I remember how this was. It was what he did next that matters. He said to his men, his shepherds, those who are with him, we're going to dig again. We're not going to let devastation carry us away. We're not going to let what's happened stop what God is about to do through us. And they said, oh, but it was filled in after the death of your father. And he said, it's still here. I don't matter. It doesn't matter to me what the enemy has come to flood and fill into the well. I know the Holy Ghost is still here. You see, when we come across a well, we say, well, that was a former move of God. That was where the, where the Holy Spirit was moving. But the Holy Spirit's not moving here today in this church or in this people. You know, he's over there. So let's all walk over there. That's the wrong result. No, it's time for us to dig again this well. The well of our Father. The well that God has placed us to build. We've got a people today who just want to move to where... It's happening. Because that's how irresponsible people act. Responsible people pick up a shovel. With a leader who will say it's time to dig again. Because this is the well of our Father. Is this sinking in this morning? Is the shovel getting below the dirt this morning? Are you hearing something that God's inspiring you today? Because I want to tell you this morning, I'm not here to preach a happy message. I'm here to cause something to happen, the ground to be broken again, and for the Holy Ghost to begin to move in our lives. Because there's a lot of people here who have parked up when it comes to the things of the Spirit and said, no, that was for a former time. I tell you, we've come back around. This is the time we begin to dig again. And you say, oh, Pastor, that's fine. It's someone else's job. Let me give you a shovel. It's our job. You see, we're in a generation today that just wants someone else to do the work. Let the government do the work. Let me tell you, the government filled in this well. That's what the Bible says. The Philistines, the governing rulers, filled in the well. There's been things that have happened over this last three years that have filled in some wells in our land. And you know what? We were blind to see what was happening. 
I'm going to give you three of them, I think, have been filled in. Number one is the well of faith. Faith. You say, oh, that's fine. Faith is believing. Believing is only part of faith. In fact, my Bible says if you believe only and you don't put your shovel up and start digging, it's as good as dead. Faith without a shovel is dead. Faith without working is dead. If you want a reference for that, I've got one. I just got so ahead of my notes. The poor man on the AV is not going to, he's not going to be happy. Where is this guy going? James 2.26 For as a body without a spirit is dead, so faith without works or without a shovel or a spade or anything that's going to help you dig is dead. Faith without action is dead. Now I want to say to you, we couldn't get shovel ready in this season. Because of what we were messed with in that time, I'm not blaming it on the government. I said there was a spirit behind what happened in our land. Just, just take the political part of it out. Look at what the enemy was doing. And so we didn't even get shovel ready in that season. Oh, there was talk about being shovel ready. But that's the trouble that creeps into the church. We talk about it, but we don't pick up the shovel. And we've got spiritual potholes all over our pathways and our roadways and our highways that are symbolic of what's happening in people's lives. We're not picking up a shovel and filling them in or digging them out because you've got to dig them out to fill them in. To put the right thing in, there's got to be digging again. Are you with me, church? So here's the thing about faith. You can believe all you like, but if you're not taking a faith step, if you're not stepping out in faith, taking a risk, you haven't activated faith. I don't talk about the Holy Spirit right now, because I think everything about the Holy Spirit is faith. At some point in time, you've just got to step out. When you got prayed for for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, there was a bit of faith on your behalf that you might receive the gift of tongues, right? There's a bit of, there's a bit of belief in your heart because someone preached a word that if you asked for the Holy Spirit, you would receive the Holy Ghost, right? Well, that's what I, I believed when I got born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I went forward in an altar call believing that God would baptize me in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, and I did. There's a whole generation that doesn't believe that today. And there's also a remnant of us not preaching that and doing that because we started to get the feedback from a people that didn't believe that and so we stopped preaching that. And everything starts in the Bible, if you, if you want to look how things start, with the preaching of the word of God. Before the signs and wonders happen, the word must first be preached. Now, God in his wisdom said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the preached word of God. Right? You can't bypass the principles of God for another method, for an online presence, for an Instagram Jesus or an Instagram Holy Spirit, you still have to preach the word. You still have to get back to Bible and you've still got to act upon it and say, well, for the signs and wonders to come, there first must be preaching of the word. And you know what? Someone's got to step out in faith. There's got to be some preacher bold enough to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to step out and preach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I say this because this is what God spoke to me about. I'm not saying it's your problem. I'm saying this is my problem. I've been pastoring for 30 years. I forgot the last time I preached about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is what the Lord reminded me of the well that I needed to dig in my life. I've got to start preaching the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know what I said to the Lord? I'll preach the baptism in the Holy Spirit if you will baptize the people I preach to. I lay hands on them, nothing happens. God said, whose problem is that? I said, yours. He said, no, it's not yours. Straight away, straight back at me. It's your problem. I am the baptizer. I will always baptize. You don't believe. You don't believe, not because of what you're saying. You don't believe because of what you are not doing. Where is your shovel, Andrew? 
ouch, it's time to dig again the well of faith. Now, I am the greatest believer in the powerful and most wonderful move of God that's about to hit our nation. You may begin to see there are moves of revival happening in university, Christian universities in America. That is just the trickle of what's about to happen. Right? And we all want a move of God, and we're waiting, and God says, pick up shovels, start digging. But God, I'm waiting for a move of God. He says, start picking up a shovel and preach, for goodness sake. Start believing again. Start digging that well again, because it can't flow until it's dug. Sorry if I'm shouting. I'm just a little bit passionate. Is this a passionate church? Are we, are we allowed to get excited in church? Are we allowed to let faith rise in the house of God? Are we allowed to believe again? Could you caution that you might believe? Second, second well, the Lord spoke to me about. Number one was preaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and doing that in faith. Second well, it's the well of worship. I got to tell you, there's some sad monuments in this nation of a former life we knew in worship that doesn't exist today. It's got very little to do about the quality of music, by the way, and all to do about what's happening in people's hearts. You see, we've, we've placed worship on a stage. And we've let a worship team yeah. lead us in worship. Yeah, that's the correct thing to do. Yeah. However, uh-huh. worship was never about us being spectators. Mm-hmm. Worship was never about the quality of the entertainment. It was never about the performance. God loves all that. But you know what he loves most is your engagement. Yeah. You see, we've developed... <coughs> I'll go back to what's happened in the last three years. When the wells have been filled in, and so you can't publicly worship, and you start to watch worship online, and then you start to get your image of worship from what's on the screen, and so, and then you come back to worship, and you say, we want to develop what's on the screen in our church, but the hearts of the people don't, don't move that way. You see, we were all about engagement. We were all about what flows naturally out of our spirit, out of our hearts, in lifting up the name of Jesus. I love when Penny said today, and it, it went a clangor. I've got to say, Penny, I was with you. I, I probably missed the moment, but you said, God is great. Did you hear him say that? And nothing happened. He said, God is good, and everyone said all the time. But he said, God is great. And we should have said, He is great. Because I'll tell you what, I was in a prayer meeting a few years ago, and in this prayer meeting, the Lord said to me, Andrew, my people call me good. But they don't call me great. Begin to preach. God is great. Because you know what? Everyone drifts when it comes to how we feel. So I come up to to Jane and say, how are you feeling today? And she says, I'm good. And you know she's not good. But we say we're good. We say we're good because that's a polite way to answer our situation. I'm good. So I started to teach my church, don't say I'm good, say I'm great. And then they caught me out because I said, I'm good. You're supposed to say you're great. Because I tell you what, there's a big difference between good and great. You see, good in our language today is very average. We don't serve a God who's average. We don't serve a, a, a beige God. We serve a colourful and bright and powerful God who is great. Psalm 51 says, you know, uh, great is the Lord and goodly to be praised. Greatly greatly to be praised. Build great praise. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to worship, here's a trap. Here's what the enemy has done to fill in the well of worship. Number one, he says you can watch it. It's a bit like video killed the radio star. You know, we stopped. When the radio played, we sang along. When the video came, we watched. Right? And they they actually wrote a song, Video Killed the Radio Star. And in the spirit, that's a little bit what's happened with worship. We've filled in this well where we no longer are vocal in our praise. We, we, we just lower the tongue. Our lips move, but our spirit's not engaged. I go into environments, I go, where's the volume? Not off the stage, off the people. And they say, it's the song. I go, no, not really, it's the spirit behind that. 
Yeah, you can, you can fudge the thing about the song all you like. I don't buy it. You know, there are songs that are easier to sing than others, for sure. But actually, it's the spirit behind that. And the well of worship has been filled in in our land. And we are no longer a people who praise him. We are no longer a people who would just lift his name and say he's great and be that people that will vocalize and declare the greatness of God. And if you can look at your own life and say, well, I'll stop doing that, there's an enemy that's come and filled that in. Yeah. It's subtle. Now, the enemy didn't come in with a, with a bulldozer and you all stood there in shock. He did it sneakily overnight, a few shovels at a time. Yeah. What did the enemy want to do? He wanted the people to move away from that land. And you know what? The enemy can get you to move away from everything that God birthed in your life. If he would be like the little frog on the pot, you know, slowly just amp the temperature up, you'll cook him. Put him into hot water, he jumps straight out, right? Because that was bad. So the enemy comes very subtly. And the Philistines went at night time to fill these wells in. Let's chuck a bit more stone in every night, a bit more stone. Eventually, the water got muddy. The people started going, this doesn't taste any good anymore. Oh, there's a better well in the valley over there. Let's move over there. And then they could fill it in completely. They didn't even have to fight the people for the land. They just walked away. Is that not a situation that we can relate to here in this land where much of what we had that was dug by our fathers has slowly been filled in and we are no longer a reflection of what was the former and we've said, well, this is the way it is now and I'm saying it's time to dig again. Dig the well of worship again. When I come back here next, I'll get excited about the quality for sure. But I'm going to get much more excited if I hear volume yeah. in the yeah. people. If I hear praise, spontaneous praise. When I come to a prayer meeting and it just goes off naturally because we're a praising people who are excited about being in this house and we just naturally do that because that's the formal well. Yeah. Number three, last one. The well of faith, the Holy Ghost. Everything about the Holy Spirit is done in faith. Number two, the well of worship. I think there's been an enemy who's filled it in our land. I don't know about here, but I know we struggled. We've been working hard at pulling out shovels, left, right, and center, and redigging our well. And number three, this is a subtle one, is the well of sacrifice. The well of sacrifice. I knew this was relevant to me when we began to call for an offering. And... Uh, being the pastor of the church, I'm the one that calls for the offering. And I have no problem with that if I am myself happy about that, believing in that. We do an annual building offering for, for building our church. Been doing it for years. And I wasn't happy about this. and I, I, I just had to say, God, why, why am I not happy about this? The Lord just said, because it's going to cost you. I, I want you to sacrifice again. But God, I, I sacrificed when we bought the building. I, I did my big sacrifice back then. You know, now, now in the building offering, I just do this a little bit every year. Every year, you know, because I, I did my big sacrifice. <laughs> and God just said, really? Really? You want to park there and miss out everything that I had planned? For you. And so we had to sacrifice this year. But as I was doing that, I realized this is a spirit that's been filled in. If it's hitting me, it's hitting other people as well. You see, there's another word that we use for this generation today. And, and you know, people of an older ilk like myself, you know, probably, probably think that we've, we're not touched by this. But it's the word entitlement. Entitlement, right? Where we are entitled to something. I look at this wonderful facility you've got here. How many years has it been here, John and Azari? 20 something years? Now I remember Pastor Bruce working on this building back then. He labored more than anybody. The well of the Father to build this place. Now I know people sacrifice finance, but it's not just finance, it's labor. 
okay? Because some people can give sacrificially. They have, they have the ability to, or, or God tells them to. And, and then there's those that can't give so much financially, but they can give manually in labor. Pastor Bruce did both. He literally hand-built this place. I remember photographs of him putting the cladding on the walls. And, 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 you know, every time I hear something happen here, there's Bruce. And, and we just said, you know, well, that's what the pastor does. Pastors aren't supposed to be building churches physically. We're supposed to be preaching the word and inspiring the people to build, right? But he leads by example. There's a whole lot of people that have come into the life of this church that didn't sacrifice an ounce for it. Praise the Lord, that's what sacrifice is. Sacrifice is someone else pays for something that you benefit for. That's what sacrifice is. So the problem with sacrifice today is that the only beneficiary of our sacrifice is for ourselves. Right? We're good at sacrificing if we're the beneficiary. You know? If I see the gain for me, I can do it. But I saw the ad for the working bee. I said, yes, I'm on the right track today. I am on fire today. Even the notices are anointing me. Working bees. They are the greatest teller of people's hearts that I can say. Because the people that turn up for the working bee are the people that are prepared to sacrifice their time with their family to say the house of God needs to be built or tidied or restored. And you might have never given financially to build this house. Come to the working bee. Begin to get the shovel out of your own well of sacrifice. And realize that this is how the house of God is built. That the well needs to flow. The enemy has come with the mentality is it someone else's job. I'm just a spectator here. Oh, I give my tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings are awesome. But let me tell you, the person that benefits most from the tithes and offerings is you. Because the, God says he rebukes the devourer on your behalf. Your behalf. Now the church obviously is resourced by that. But the truth of the matter is... You're freed from the enemy's attack when you tithe. So once again, tithing should be just not a question for us because we're the beneficiary. Come on. Sacrifice is about what you do that someone else benefits. So, there's a kid's church out there and someone's sacrificing for your children. Boy, they need a reward, not in heaven. They need a reward right now. They need you to go out there and you thank them and tell them how awesome they are, that they made a sacrifice because there was this awesome preacher preaching the fire of God and they didn't hear it. Because they missed out. What are you going to do for them? Oh, yeah, that's right. What are you going to do? What shovel are you going to pick up? For everyone who sacrifices because you didn't do something and someone else did it for you. Church, are you seeing there's, there's a need for a shovel in this hour? Let me tell you what happened to the church of Aotearoa, New Zealand, over the last three years. Number one, people left the church. Number two, people stopped worshipping. Number three, volunteerism died in New Zealand. The spirit of volunteering. And that didn't happen just to churches. Every organization around is scrambling for volunteers because we went inward and we said, let's look after our, tro- our lot. My whānau, my lot, my family. That's all that matters in this COVID time, my lot. Wars aren't won on looking after my lot. Wars are won by people who say, I'll fight for my nation. Wars are won by people who sacrifice. Wars are won by people who say, I'll fight for my church. And I've got to lay down some of what I want to do to serve in an area that's lacking. I'm sure in every church, Penny, you'll find this. We need people to serve here in this ministry, people to serve here in this ministry, people to serve here in this ministry. And the call goes to blank ears. Oh, that's somebody else's job. Man, I wish I could hand out shovels today. To say, church, we're not going to build this place unless we dig. Unless we dig. Would you stand with me this morning? I didn't come here to rock you up. But I have, probably. I've come to be obedient to what I think the Church of Aotearoa New Zealand needs to hear. 
is what it needs to hear. Because we are not worshipping the way we should. We're not stepping out of faith the way we should. We're denying the Holy Ghost moving in our land just because of what we believe should be or shouldn't be. Let me tell you what. God's about to burst the banks. You're either prepared for it or you're unprepared for it. I want to be prepared for it. I want to have a shovel in my hand and be digging because we have to be a people who are in pursuit of the Holy Ghost, not denying the Holy Spirit. Well, let me tell you what, there's going to be some sacrificing. Because we've got to, we've got to build this house. There are thousands of people in Hamilton City. God is preparing. But you're not ready. I'm not ready in my city. We just haven't had the heart to realize that we are the net that's going to catch the fish. We are the net. We are the net. Oh, we're full of holes. We're, we're old and smelly. We haven't been washed and cleaned and revved and prepared. You know, we're trying to be, we're trying to, you've seen those guys that can cast those, those nets? That net has to be really supple and clean to cast like that. No, it's just we've been stored in the youth cupboard. I know you've got a cupboard like that because we've got one too. Broken down, unwashed, mouldy, it's not prepared. You try casting that net, it's not working very well for you, everything swims out of it. You hear what I'm saying, church? This is the time to pick up a shovel and say it's time to dig again because the Lord's brought you back around. I can tell because there's some faces here. It's just amazing. We're, we're back you're back to dig. Yeah. It's just not enough to say, oh, this is a shadow of, of former things. Be like Isaac. He said, it's here. The guy says, oh, just leave it. Just go and dig somewhere else, man. He said, no, this is my father's well, and I know it's here. I know the flow is here. I know the water is here. I know that if I dig here, I'm going to find the water. I know there's going to be life here. There's going to be life Grab a shovel. So I'm already serving. Serve more. Serve more. I'm already doing this. Do more. Shovel's all about hard work. You've been on a shovel all day. Your body tells you, man. It tells you. I haven't done this for a while. And you got a prayer meeting. That's digging ditches. Hey? Yeah, prayer's about digging ditches. You dig ditches in prayer meetings. What for? Because nothing happens. Wait till it rains. Ditches fill up and they become aqueducts. The flow of what all God wants to do is born out of ditches dug in prayer. You know the simple things that we are founded on? The Bible, reading God's Word, preaching God's Word, baptism of the Holy Spirit, praying. They all work. There's been an enemy that's tried to fill us in and try to say it doesn't work anymore. I'm telling you, it does. you just got to dig out the rubble. you just got to dig out the compromise. you just got to dig out everything that the enemy has thrown in there. There's dirt in there. Yeah, there's dirt in that well. The stuff of this world gets chucked in and we're no longer as the firebrands we used to be. I'll tell you what, I'm 61 years old and I'm firing up now. I'm more fired up now than I've ever been. I feel like I'm meant to be a trumpet that sounds an alarm in this nation because war is about to happen in the spirit. And there has to be someone who will travel the land and be the trumpet of God and sound the alarm and beat your plowshares into swords because the day of the Lord is coming. The move of God is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming to fill the church. Lost are going to get saved. Sick people are going to get healed. I tell you what, you won't be able to stop it. You can say, stop it. You can't stop it. It's like a flood. You just got to be prepared. How does it start? It starts by digging. It's time to dig again. Are you fired up, church? Is there some faith in the house today to believe you can do this? That you can be the people of God again and come into new life? There's fire coming. There's fresh fire coming. There's passion coming. I tell you, I'm excited for this house. Get them out. Get out a mighty tent and just buy a truckload of shovels for you. Instead, we'll rub the kitchen and you can have a teaspoon each or something. You know. Go out of here with a symbol of saying, it's time for me to dig again. Bow your heads. Maybe the worship team could come. I want to sing that song. 
you know, uh, oh. worthy is your name. Because I tell you what, I want to hear the people praise him this morning. I, I love this band. I love the skill. I oh, bless the Lord for that. I want to hear people sing. You know, we've got accustomed to songs that are all about me, all about what's happening in me. Where are the songs that tell of the greatness of our God? Where, where are the songs that just focus on Him and about lifting up His name? You know, worthy is your name, Jesus. That's the most powerful name, Jesus, in all the earth. Songs that talk about Jesus, not about you. I mean, yeah, God's doing something great, but it's not about you, it's about Him. Father, I pray for Hamilton New Life today. I pray for the recipients of your word. I pray there's been, Lord, seed sown into a place where once again it will just not be ripped off by the birds in the air. The weeds and the thorns of this life will not take it. We declare, Lord God, today that this will be a word that will find good soil and it will grow. And once again, we can say, this is surely Rehoboth, for there the Lord has made room for us and we will be a fruitful church in this city, Father God. So we thank you for your powerful deposit today. In Jesus' mighty name. Church is at the site, so put your hands together and pray.